Good afternoon. I'm uh, Martha Woodmansey, a member of the English department in the law school. And I'm happy to welcome you this afternoon and to welcome you to the annual Edward S. and Melinda Milton Sater lecture in writing in the disciplines. We're very pleased that Ed and Melinda were able to come up from Columbus uh, to participate today because it gives us an opportunity to thank them in person for their generous support of this important building stone in our growing Center for the Study of Writing. There will be a reception in the rotunda after the lecture to which all of you present are invited. And I know that many of you are going to want to say hello to Ed and Melinda, so if you wouldn't mind just showing who you are there. Um, our sincere thanks for your support to the center. I also want to thank the Law School's Center for, the, for Law, Technology, and the Arts, the Department of History, the Department of English, and Calvin Smith Library, all of which jumped in at the opportunity to bring Adrian Johns to campus today to help us get handles on the promise and the apparent manifold shortcomings of the Universal Library Project that Google has undertaken. Uh, Adrian was educated at Cambridge University and comes to us from the University of Chicago, where he's a professor of history working in the history of science, the history of the book, and the history of intellectual property. Adrian's scholarly accomplishments are, uh, well, daunting, um, not least because his books have captured the attention of the general reader, as well as scholars across the disciplines, but also because, or even though, they're deliciously long. <laughs> I first got to know Adrian in his 753-page tome on the nature of the book, published in 1998. And two more important interventions have appeared just this past year, uh, pa the path-breaking 625-page piracy book, uh, subtitled The Intellectual Property Wars from Gutenberg to Gates, and the 305-page virtual chat book length, a uh, glimpse into the 1960s world of pirate radio that's titled Death of a Pirate. Today, as I said, Adrian's going to shed some much needed historical light on our Western culture's most recent visioning of a universal library. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Adrian Jones. Uh, thank you, Martha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for inviting me to all the uh, various agencies and departments and so forth that have made this possible. Um, you know, I always think it must be a tremendous amount of work to bring together alliances of this kind. So I'm. No. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know. It, I know it is because I, you know, I, I've. I've resisted this for as long as possible, but it's got to the point in one's career where one is actually involved in administration. And, and I now know that, that those kinds of strings of, of departmental uh, names are not put together without effort, you know, tea, um, <laughs> uh, meeting times, and so forth. Anyway, I'm, I'm grateful that it all worked out. Um, so it won't have escaped anybody's notice that... Uh, what, a couple of weeks ago, um, Judge Denny Chin turned back a proposed settlement that would have not only um, you know, pu put aside the, the controversies between Google and the publishing industry and a bunch of authors um, about the Google scanning project, um, but actually created something like a whole new environment in which big uh, digital library systems could be put together. Um, and I want to begin with that, that decision that Judge Denny Chin made, because it, it's an important one. Um, and it has the virtue of actually being rather clearly written, unlike the original settlement, uh, which if you've looked at it is long, complex, uh, you know, full of curlicues and epicycles and so forth. Uh, the judgment is not. Um, the judgment, and, and that one of the virtues of that is that the 
um, places where one might disagree with it are also clearly evident. Um, you don't need to dig around very far from them, for them. So, um, so this is a project, as you will know, that's been running for five or six years now. Uh, Google, the huge search company, has been devoting itself to uh, scanning millions of books that are held in various academic and public libraries, both in the US and abroad. Um, and these, these books would then be made available online in various forms depending on their copyright status. So a large number of the books are just out of copyright. These are ones that, that were published before the, the, uh, the period of copyright protection kind of begins, as it were, for, which is still in operation now, uh, which is, what, 1920 or so. Um, some of them are, are straightforwardly in copyright and have identifiable publishers and authors and so forth, and those would be restricted by agreement with Google and the various parties concerned. Then there's a huge uh, population of so-called orphan books, which typically are out of print, but are technically still in copyright. So they were published between about 1920 and, and uh, now, but we don't know perhaps who the copyright owners would be for these texts. There's a large number of these books. Most of them, it must be said, are books that are never going to be bestsellers, let's put it that way. Um, you know, they're, they're books that uh, have often been forgotten for understandable reasons, uh, you know, and have fallen out of the proprietary system. But nonetheless, they are a difficult issue for a system of publishing and distribution and storage and so forth that defines itself around copyright law. Um, and it turned out that the, the problem of orphan books was a, a defining problem for this project, which was rather utopian, to create something like a universal online library. Um, so Google launched itself into this project about five or six years ago, and it's created a lot of commentary, um, a lot of favorable uh, remarks, and a lot of usage. I mean, everybody who's an academic, if they're honest, uses this thing. And for all the, the criticism that it's, it's uh, it's excited. Um, there is a sense in which to get the bottom line truth proposed to an academic that Google might simply throw up its hands, give up and walk away and not do it. That's the point at which they blanch and go white, right? Um, even the critics for the most part. Everybody pretty much, except possibly Bob Danton, thinks that this should go ahead. Um, the question is under what terms and, and with what protections and, and uh, and, and protocols and so forth. Um, the intensity of the debate, though, is, I think, justified. Um, you know, I, I live, for, for the most part, in the world of the humanities, and this is a world which has become, I think, rather unfortunately, imbued with hyperbole. So all kinds of humanistic projects are labelled as being stunning, wonderful, world-changing, and so forth. This is one that actually is, I think. I think, for once, that rhetoric is actually justified. This is a project that... Um, will change what writing is in the future. Um, it will change what knowledge is and how we get knowledge. And it will also change what the past is for that kind of quasi-Orwellian uh, reason that, that you know, he who controls the pre present controls the past. What we can know about the past will be altered by this project's existence. Um, not least, one should say, uh, what we can know about the past of this project may be altered by its existence. So for Judge Chin, um, there were really seven kinds of issue that he said that he was addressing in coming up with the verdict, that, the, the decision that he did, um, some of which he dismissed out of hand. So uh, was, for example, the notice that was given out to authors about having to opt out of this system adequate? And Chin decided that that, that really wasn't much of an issue, it was adequate. Um, were the parties in the lawsuit actually representative of the class that they claimed to be representative of in turning it into a class action suit. There he had problems, um, and, and problems were sufficient to maybe turn the, the proposed settlement back for that reason. Um, more seriously, um, this is a, a deal, a proposed deal, that would have had an impact beyond just resolving this suit. Um, the suit originated actually long enough ago that it was, it was really, in the first instance, not about how creating a whole online library and what's now actually a bookstore, but, um, but producing what were called snippet views, do you remember these things, that were going to be issued out as a result of search queries. Uh, it's become something much more than that, and in its, in its proposed settlement, it would have created an, an entire 
ecology, as it were, for the future development of these kinds of big library projects. So in other words, it was, it was dealing with creating a forward-looking environment, and that may be something that's beyond the scope of a, of a settlement of this kind. Um, then when it comes to copyright and antitrust, um, traditionally, deciding big issues of copyright like this is supposed to fall under the prerogatives of, co of Congress. And Judge Chin decided that this was another case of, of that kind. It was inappropriate for him, in principle, to decide something that, that was properly uh, devoted to the judgment of, of the public representative. Um, and he also thought that the scanning of orphan works, which in the revised settlement would be made a, an opt-out protocol. So Google would basically be, be uh, indemnified, as it were, for scanning all of these works. Um, and and the, the, it would, the onus would be put on uh, copyright owners, if they existed, to actually opt out of this system rather than opting in, which is what the judge in the end wanted. And Judge Chin decided that this actually was a breach of copyright. And the, some of his language is actually quite stark. He, he accuses Google of a kind of wanton, massive scale copyright breach. Um, and, uh, and then there are concerns about antitrust. Is, does this involve horizontal pricing agreements? Is it creating a new kind of monopoly on these orphan books? And is it boosting Google's perhaps de facto monopoly on searching at all? Um, and then there are two other concerns, finally. Uh, privacy. Uh, one of the points of this for Google is to gather information on readers, on readers and their habits. Um, are there sufficient safeguards for privacy involved in it? Especially given that this will be a, a, a single... Um, access point, as it were, to the world of information. Um, and Judge Chin really brushed that concern aside by saying that it was conceivable that one could come up with better safeguards for privacy in the future and build them into the agreement. It's entirely unclear that there was any actual will to, to produce such better safeguards, but nonetheless the possibility he regarded as sufficient to, to negate the concern. And I'll come back to that, because I think that's an important point. Um, and finally, international law. Uh, the French government, the German government, and various other non-US interests weighed in, worried about the, the implications of this for non-US legal systems. And um, Chin thought that was a, a real concern. I'm not really going to talk about it. I actually think that it may end up being the biggest concern legally of all, but, uh, but I'm not going to go into it. Um, so this is a, a decision that has potentially far-reaching consequences, as far-reaching as the, as the uh, venture, as the project itself. Um, I want to say, though, that like many of the debates that have taken place about this project, it's rather narrowly drawn, understandably so, because it's a, it's a, you know, a legal system issue. And for me, as a historian generally, I, it's my professional duty, as it were, to have concerns and interests that range beyond the legal. Um, so I, I think that there are issues in the Google project that, that, that the settlement doesn't address, that the debate around the settlement didn't address, and that Judge Chin's uh, decision, therefore, doesn't address. And I want to talk about some of those. Um, I think that when addressing what's been trumpeted as this project's real purpose, which is to transform how knowledge itself is gained and stored and circulated and put to use, protagonists of all kinds, of all stripes, have rested content with, I think, rather crude and unhistorical generalizations about those processes. And I think that's actually typical of concerns, of, of debates about media and their impact. So I want to uh, give some, I, I want to counteract that. I want to say that, that it matters to have a debate that is, that is deeper and, and more wide reaching. Um, and in particular, I want to suggest that the advent of something like a universal library today should be approached in terms of the purposes and uses of the Universal Library as well as in terms of its composition. Because I think if there is a, a cultural revolution that, that's at, st at stake here, and I think there may be, then its nature lies more in the realms of purpose and in practice than in the realm of collection per se. Um, so in other words, one should ask the Aristotelian question, what is a Universal Library for? What is its final cause? And in particular, why does the Google project exist? Well, it turns out that we have a certain amount of testimony from Google itself about why it exists. One engineer at Mountain View suggested an answer to the question in an encounter with an internet aficionado called George Dyson about three or four years ago. He said, 
We are not scanning all these books to be read by people. We're scanning them to be read by an AI, that is an artificial intelligence. And he was referring to what the proposed settlement calls non-display uses or non-consumptive research. That is kind of data mining, pattern recognition, algorithmic techniques, things like that. On that account, what's really at the core of this project and what's really transformative about it is that it supersedes reading itself, if by reading you think that there's some kind of human involvement. Now, as it happens, I don't think that the Google Books project really is directed primarily at machine learning, because if it were, then the metadata standards about which people have raised a lot of fuss would have been better, and Google would have been less insouciant about the problems with those standards that have been pointed out. Still, the fact that a statement like this could have been made and that it's even conceivable is, I think, very telling. And in fact, it's been, it's been urged that it may well prove to be the case anyway that the data mining uses of this archive or universal library will be, in economic terms, more consequential than the reading uses. Um, but dis compared to what's called display uses, that is, everything that involves human eyes, um, non-display uses of this kind have received scant public attention. And they don't receive any attention, really, in the Judge Chin verdict either. The, the only place where they come up is in that issue about privacy. And that's not entirely our fault, it's worth saying, because the concept of a non-display use is historically very unfamiliar. It could hardly have been imagined before network digital systems. So use is carried out on books treated en masse as data or information without any eyes seeing any page of any book are radical departures from prior practices. There's no legal tradition to shape and constrain these uses, or almost none, and little by way of ethical reflection to draw on either. When it comes to human readers, we have something like 300 years of copyright law to argue from and about, and when it comes to machine readers, we have essentially nothing. So that's what we've done. We've argued on the basis of 300 years of copyright. But Google's own conditions, it's worth pointing out, are actually rather strict. Um, they include, for example, a rule that no product could emerge from a, from a non-display use that would compete with Google's own ventures going down into the future. Um, furthermore, there seems to be no right, except for a short-term provisional one, for an author or a publisher to opt out of non-display uses. So if the opt-out rule is a problem in its own, in its own right, there isn't even an opt-out rule for this. Um, what that means is that a redefinition of publishing and authorship, to say nothing of reading, is on the cards, and I think has actually already taken place to a large extent. These things will have to incorporate into their very meanings the certainty of a work's being included into these kinds of systems. If not Google's, then, then somebody else's. And it will become part of the roles of publishers and authors, writers, to anticipate this fact uh, and to make decisions accordingly. And it's worth saying that you know, that's new in one sense, but in another sense, it's not new at all. Publishers and authors have had to make this kind of predictive uh, guess, as it were, this kind of wager, for a long time. It's just that they've been dealing with human readers' responses and not um, algorithmic ones. And for me, this raises historical questions, questions both of history and for history. How does this relate to plans for universal libraries over time, such that we've arrived at this point? How did those earlier universal libraries, and the, there is a long history of them, um, promise or threaten to affect the practices of knowledge in these kinds of ways? Um, how, in fact, did they affect such practices? And the answers I want to suggest throw real light on the kinds of problems that we actually now face, which are not reducible to those problems that the, uh, that the judge uh, identified in his categories in, in the settlement. And I want to approach them by asking about place and practice. So first of all, where is the universal library? Um, well, firstly, the place of reading and writing matters. This is, this is common knowledge in academia. It affects how we read and write and to what effect. The implications of launching a universal library that's digital right now have to be appraised partly in terms of the changes that are underway at actual, physical, non-universal libraries. Um, and this is, of course, a moment of acute critical pressures on those. So, for example, at Syracuse University, notoriously, the Dean of Libraries recently announced that physical libraries were, in her word, kaput. Um, and Syracuse, she said, had moved to store volumes not just off-site, but 250 miles away. So you can't just call them up. You, know, you have to go through a rigmarole. Um, and that's not the worst case. The worst case seems to be that of Cambridge, my own alma mater in the UK, where old medical journals are now being put in dark storage, not just temporarily, but permanently which means that they're held not only off-site, but actually inaccessible. You can't pull them up at all. 
And it, I think that short of invoking something like nuclear war, it's difficult to think of any way in which dark storage of this kind can actually be an actively good thing. Um, one of the characteristics, though, of a universal digital library is that it may provide ammunition for saying that it is a good thing. So if the universal library is to lead to a place of reading that is in theory no place, but is in practice other kinds of places and perhaps degraded places, what does that imply? Well, the associations are ambiguous because on the one hand, knowledge that's created in no particular place may be regarded as objective because it could have arisen in any place if you see that kind of philosophical argument. On the other hand, practices of reading are of course never placeless in reality and universality means reading in lots of actual physical locations. This being so, it can be argued that there are real advantages to having it occur in a site designed for the practice, even if that site is networked. And that's in part what a physical library is. It's interesting that in all the, all the debates about um, access, for example, which are part of the universal library uh, contentions, there's a lot of utopian talk about making access universal as well as content universal. Uh, but if you look at where people are actually drawing digital files to, all of the utopian talk about making access available to places like sub-Saharan Africa is really rather vacuous. The actual access points are not sub-Saharan Africa. They're, they're uh, you know, Europe, America, Australia, places like that. Um, and that's really to do with physical place. It's not something that you can abstract out into the networks. I want to say that, in, in connection to this, that there is a history of the very concept of universality that, that is important in this light. And I want to briefly go through what I think this history is. Um, and I'm going to present it in four stages of what you might think of as ancient universality, Renaissance universality, Enlightenment universality, and modern universality. The point being that we are now going into some new kind of universality which doesn't leave behind, necessarily, the problems that that prior history has left us. Now, the history of universal libraries is not actually continuous from the ancient world, and it's important to say that because it's sometimes implied that it is. But many, and perhaps all, of the later incarnations of the dream of universality have referred back in some way to especially the Library of Alexandria, as the Fonz et Origo. This was founded in about 300 BC, and it reportedly amassed about 500,000 scrolls, depending on transnational trade to obtain them. So the pharaoh's men would monitor ships coming in. If the ships contained scrolls, they would take the scrolls away, copy them, and give the copies back to the ships. So you kept the originals. Tony Grafton says rather cheekily that this is roughly what Google is doing. I'm not sure that's really true. But, uh, um, but as significant as that sheer accumulation of material was the accumulation of site-specific reading practices devoted to the material. So it's often said that textual criticism, authentication techniques, bibliographical classification uh, originated here in a cast of, as it were, librarians, though we know almost nothing about what those methods actually were. But there were various other ancient libraries that existed, some of them reputedly very large, like this one, which is at Ephesus um, in Turkey. And I put the image up because there's basically physically nothing that survives of the ancient library of Alexandria, whereas this does survive. And you can actually see, if you go into it, how ancient architects and builders tried to create buildings for scrolls. So it has things like uh, shelving apparatus or the remains of them. Um, and the, the, net, the person after whom the building is named is reputedly buried under the portico. Um, but Alexandria is the dominant example and no, one's had, no, no other library has had anything like its iconic status in subsequent history so Renaissance universality so the Renaissance saw the revival of the ideal of a universal library in the first age of print um, but you now didn't have to go somewhere unique to find this kind of illusion of literary universality there was more than one universal library and some of them belonged to private citizens not to pharaohs so, for example, John, John Dee was supposed to have one at Mortlake outside London, and Gabriel Noday gave rules for setting one up in his instructions concerning erecting of a library that was written originally for the president of the Parlement of Paris, which is a kind of law court. But it was soon clear that no one building could house a universal library with printing in existence. So attention began to shift to the idea of a kind of virtual place. This meant creating a kind of distributed library through print, Conrad Gesner's Bibliotheca Universalis, the Universal Library, was meant to be a virtual library of this kind, a kind of volume that surveyed the entirety of the domain of print. But what Gesner found, of course, was that he was only halfway through this by, by the time he realised that there was now more books that had to be included. So there has to be a second volume, a subs subsidiary volume, and there are additions and new indices and things like that. So after a while, the, um, the, the 
distributed, printed universal library becomes not just a book, but a periodical. Uh, it enters into the world of journals that, that structured the Republic of Letters and then the public sphere in the 18th century. Um, by the late 17th century, the notion of the, notion of the Bibliothèque Universelle, which is now French, not Latin, being produced in parts, had given rise to this idea that the Universal Library had to be not only a printed object and not so much a building, but something that went on in principle forever. You know, you, there was not going to be an end point to it. And these kinds of w works, the Bibliothèque Universelle Historique in this case, became major fora for the Enlightenment itself. There's actually several of them, but they, they become subject specific over time. The reading room for this Universal Library was the boundless space known as the Republic of Letters. And access to this was supposedly unlimited, but it had elaborate codes of civility, hierarchy, organization, exchange, uh, reading, annotation, feedback, and things like that. And some of the bibliographic systems that were invented for universal libraries of this kind were in fact derived from these codes of reading, exchange, civility, and so forth, especially the commonplace schemes of scholarly readers. So that is, readerly techniques fed into classification sciences for this kind of universal library. And they were then put in turn to use by new writers and new readers. And that leads to the idea of enlightenment universality. And probably the most famous image of a universal library ever created. This in 1785 by um, Etienne Louis Boulet, a visionary architect working under the French king. This was going to be an extension to the Royal Library in Paris, and it expressed the king of France's ambitions to be universal monarch. Uh, there was a strict dress code for readers in this library. Uh, you had to dress as a Greek philosopher. Um, <laughs> those, those were the days. You know? um, now this was never built, of course, but there were, in fact, real places in the Enlightenment that embraced an idea of universality. But again, it's a different one. Um, it's it's subject-specific. The most notable of these is the university, li university Library at Göttingen in Germany, where the librarian developed an acquisitions policy, the first, in fact, for any such institution, which defined universality in terms of the coverage of specific research fields. This is the moment when research is becoming definitive of the new kind of would-be romantic university. The library even printed journals, which, became, which were like catalogues in the public sphere, that extended the reach of this subject-based policy across the Republic of Letters. And in fact, many of the practices of modern research univers universities can be traced back to Göttingen in this period. At the same time in France, the Marquis de Condorcet, the great Enlightenment thinker, was developing this kind of notion of universality to define the virtual space of print itself. Condorcet proposed that print should create a universal library of the Enlightenment by abandoning authorship as its principle of classification. Instead, the tree of knowledge should become a kind of card catalogue for a limitless virtual library defined as at Göttingen by subjects, not by, not by authors. And the law of publishing itself should be transformed accordingly. So Condorcet wanted to eliminate authorial copyright, such as it was in the 18th century, and replace it with a system of periodicals, each defined by specialism. So you would no longer publish a book under your name. You would publish a paper in a journal according to topic. And this was going to be the practical realization of enlightenment, literally the dispersion of light from central sources, namely Paris, um, uncorrupted by individual pride. It would make the Republic of Letters into the counterpart for Adam Smith's Republic of Trade. And it's significant that Condorcet was also an agitator for doing away with you know, guild privileges and things like that. Now, that scheme was not put into effect, of course, at least until the French Revolution, when a version of it was, actually, and all of the privileges of authors and booksellers were abolished as relics of the old regime. The consequence, as Carla Hesse has argued, was a catastrophe, at least for the, the, the high-status publishing industry in Paris. Um, and Romanticism, in fact, then repudiated the idea wholeheartedly, elevating individual genius in its place, but of that more in a moment. Um, then in the, the period since, since then, or since the early 19th century, when media have proliferated so remarkably, um, ideas of universality proliferated with them, and this is one of the characteristics of modern universality, that it's, it's branched off in so many different ways. For example, in the 1890s, French bibliophiles published an essay on the end of the book, illustrated by the visionary artist Albert Robida. Uh, these pictures actually come from Willis Silverman's The New Bibliopolis, published in 2008, which is a, a great treatment of this. So Robida imagined a world with universal cliché texts, as he called them, store, storing storeographs on Edison-style cylinders. And the sounds would then be transmitted through telephonoscopes into vending machines on the street, where so you could actually pull a story out of a vending machine. 
and homes like this one where you have elegant Parisian ladies on balconies looking over the kind of hellish dark satanic mills that, that Paris becomes. Um, and this new culture would come with its own origin myth. Uh, you may know that, that in the early years of printing, Fust, the financier for Gutenberg, was confused with Faustus because it was thought that printing may have been an invention of the devil. Uh, here you have the Edisonian disc again being handed down to the, the counterpart of, of Fust or Gutenberg by a demon. Um, and it would have its own anti-counterfeiting, anti-pirate anti measures. So you could patent your, your storiograph um, by getting a guarantee against contrefaçon, which means piracy in, in French. Um, now the best known, so there's, so there's lots of kind of schemes like this that come around in the modern era, the best known of which in this country is probably Veneva Bush's Memex project that would have used uh, microfilm. But much more interesting, I think, is actually the project of Paul Otley called the Mundaneum, because it actually existed in Brussels in the 1920s. Otley was a pioneer of scientific bibliography who envisaged extending bibliographers, bibliographers' classification schemes into books themselves, into the contents of books, so he would classify facts, images, quotations, things like that, languages, arguments. And he created a physical space, an office, that was filled with network screens to visualize this kind of architecture of intelligence that, that he mapped out here. Um, he called this whole thing the radiated library, or the universal book, or a web, a réseau, which was connected by links. And the idea was that information held in this place could be brought into each desk by means of these links. And, uh, and members of the lay pu public would submit queries by telegraph into it, rather like searches, search queries. Um, and answers could then be sent back out into the world by the staff. And it was actually in operation for, for something like 15 years. It was meant to become, as he put it, a universal edifice containing all books and all information. It had a utopian aspect. It was originally associated with plans to cite the League of Nations in Brussels, and the, the Belgian government actually supported it for that reason. And it, when, when it turned out that the League of Nations, firstly, wasn't going to be the utopian thing that people thought it was, and then was not going to be cited in Brussels, it rather fell into disrepair by the mid-30s that had lost state support, and what was left was abandoned at the beginning of World War II when Belgium was invaded by the Germans. Um, there was actually some part of it that survived, though, forgotten in a storeroom in a university in, in Belgium until the late 1960s when a graduate student rediscovered it, at which point the university administration, realising that it had a spare room, destroyed what was left. <laughs> there's actually there's a little bit of it left. There's a museum that still exists, but, but it's one of those things that makes you love university administrations. Um, now, as I say, there are several schemes along these kinds of lines, all premised on the use of new technologies, typically microfilm in this period, to collate information from various media into a single scopic device, typically a desktop. And these are, but the effects of this, where there were effects, were not necessarily all good. For example, think of um, microfilming of newspapers. It's notorious that massive amounts of newspaper stock were destroyed on the idea that microfilm was going to be enough in some kind of apparatus like this and it turned out not to be enough. On the other hand, there was the STC microfilming, short title catalogue microfilming of 16th and 17th century books produced in Britain, undertaken originally as a kind of rescue archaeology when it looked like Britain might be bombed to bits by the Luftwaffe, um, but it's ended up being a revolutionary force for the good, I think, in the study of the early modern period. Uh, by contrast, the study of modernity has actually languished, ironically enough. Um, because the amount proportioned to, to what was produced that's been made available through these kinds of systems is much smaller. Now, this kind of world also creates new questions of universality to do with access, for example. Who has access to this? Who could send a question in? What questions would be treated? Um, under what terms do you have access and who polices it? And how does it extend beyond national and other territorial boundaries? This has become, obviously, a huge issue uh, once again, with, with digital networking, because digital networks tend to extend beyond legal territorial zones. And the open access movement in the sciences is really a, a, a kind of very successful institutional version of that kind of concern. Um, now, the other side of this concern is, of course, the action of what it is to make something public, publishing. What is its role when you have universal libraries of this kind in existence? And it, too, has faced this kind of angst-ridden issue. I think publishing is kind of angst-ridden intrinsically, but, but it's been angst-ridden especially in the digital age, partly because it's faced this kind of existential question of what it actually is. I think a good case can be made that publishing is the business of managing credibility in this world. It isn't about manufacturing. 
It isn't particularly about marketing either. It's the enterprise of ascertaining and affirming the worth of particular authorial works, singling them out for advantageous exposure or distribution, and sustaining that authority and, and authenticity from then on. So in previous centuries, publishers employed, or earlier still were, printers, and handled the actual manufacture of books, but that's not the core of what they are. And what we're seeing, I think, with, with the advent of this kind of universality is a, either a recognition or an active reconstitution of publishing along these lines. Um, so universality has a long history involving destruction as well as preservation. And through that long history, aspirations of placelessness have repeatedly come up against the need for actual places with distinct publics and practices. And we need this kind of historical typology of reading practices, especially across these places, not least because reading and the knowledge it facilitates is being changed now by the intercalation of, of our kind of universality, as in the Google project, of virtuality and digital networks. I think in a digital universal library, one of the things we have to do, and this may become the problem of, of historical knowledge in the future, is to work to coordinate our reading practices with the habits of original readers, be they in the 17th century or the 16th or the 14th. For example, in the sciences, printed journals are now an anachronism. Scientists don't employ them in their own research, as they did before about 1990 or so. Instead, they use digital journals, e-print archives, and the like. And this has consequences, not all of them good, because the horizon of conceivability has actually contracted. And you can demonstrate this using mega database information. The haste of consensus formation has accelerated, so that, so that maybe that as, one, as a kind of herd instinct that's focused by things like Google, Goes, it increases the rapidity of consensus building, we may be missing potentially valuable alternatives. Um, and, uh, but, it, but as a historian of science, this means that we shouldn't be shoehorning current scientific texts, as we call them, into a model of reading of printed pages that their target community does not in fact practice. So it would be misrepresenting reading practices um, you know, by, by assuming a kind of print model of them. But by the same token, we shouldn't be relying on digital images of 17th century tracts and assume that our reading in some way corresponds to the historical reading of those originals. So the question for history is what do we do about this? How do we translate, as it were, between the reading practices of our universality, which is in fact embedded in our technology and our society and our taxonomy of places, and the reading practices of their universality, whoever they are, and that would be embedded in their technology, culture, and their taxonomy of places. Now, these are very broad questions which have to do with how knowledge is arrived at, what it is, how it's circulated, to whom, and what people do with it. To put it a bit hyperbolically, they have to do with the nature and fate of civilization. So I want to bring it a bit down to earth by talking about a, an episode, if you like, a way in which the history of universal libraries has actually shaped our predicament now, including the Google issue. Um, so think about those terms that are at stake in our own time, principles of authorship and creativity, the practices and institutions of research, the travails of the publishing industry, the virtues of mass access, all of those things that, that arise in the Google uh, debates. All of those have their historical trajectories. Those trajectories did, though, come together at an earlier moment as well, the moment when Romanticism encountered the advent of a mass culture industry and the origins of the research university in the generation around 1800 to 1830. I said before that I would come back to Romanticism, and this is, this is where I'm going to come back to it. So this is a period, so 1800 to 1830, when like our own, like our own period, there was a media revolution at hand, and people were very conscious of it. It's the era when you go from uh, wooden hand presses, which essentially are the same as Gutenberg's from, from 300 years earlier, um, 400 years earlier, to uh, first iron presses and then steam presses by the 1830s. That increases output rates by orders of magnitude. It reduces costs, at least for those works that are being produced by the steam presses. Um, things like stereotyping, steam paper manufacture contribute to this. People were very aware that what they were going through was a, was a transformation. Um, and it's a social transformation as well. So the publisher as a social kind really originates in this generation. People loosely talk about publishers from earlier, but they really didn't exist. So it's, from, it's at this time, for example, that one finds Sir Walter Scott's novels so, selling in unprecedented numbers, and it's often said that his, was, his were the first bestsellers. And at the same time, the cosy world of the academy was being upended by post-Jacobin reform in France and the Humboldtian in, innovations in Germany. So the modern research university also gen, originates in this period. And it turns out that in this time, there was a bitter struggle over proposals to create a universal library. 
Um, it was going to be housed in the apparently public institution of the university, and it was going to be devoted to collecting the output of the entire publishing industry, both old and new. Uh, but the debate was not just about collection and selection. It was about use. It was about research. It was about the institutions of research. And it was about the future. It was about how collecting would affect the actual making of readings, writings, and new knowledge. Now, the, the, everybody knew that the stakes were very high, uh, partly because enlightenment was thought to rest on print itself. That was a widely acknowledged reality. Um, so it was very important to collect the output of printing to preserve existing knowledge and to facilitate future progress. Enlightened societies ought to do this. And these libraries ought to be public, at least in some sense of that term. At least they shouldn't be just the preserve of castes devoted to priestcraft and mystery of state. Now in England, which is where this debate really blew up in the biggest sense, the approach to creating a universal library was rather pragmatic because it rested on the ancient universities primarily, Oxford and Cambridge. Their libraries, this is the Bodleian set up in the early 17th century, claimed a right to get a copy of every book published in London. This was a very centralised publishing industry, so London is really what matters. This claim descended ultimately from a private agreement of 1610 that Bodley had, had done with the Stationers' Company, the old guild of, of printers, in, in establishing the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Um, but more directly, it derived from the 1710 Copyright Act, which is the world's first copyright law, um, which established the, the limited term protection, all of those things that became copyright. There's a little noticed part of that law that says that books registered for copyright have to be given one copy each to, to a number of libraries around the country, in particular Oxford and Cambridge and the Royal Library in London. Um, now, that statute then um, gave a certain number of copies to these libraries. That, the, the way that the publishing industry interpreted this in the 18th century, the bookselling industry, was that it was a bargain. So if you had a book that was potentially subject to piracy, you might register it for copyright. Giving the copies to the library was then a fee, essentially, for that copyright protection. If then you had books that were not going to be subject to piracy, you didn't need to register for them for copyright, so you didn't need to give them to the libraries. That meant that what the libraries were being given, or what they were being offered at least, were all the books that were most likely to be pirated, which means plays, sermons, you know, to a certain extent, novels, though novels were kind of one-off at this point. Um, it was not what the libraries actually wanted, which was Latin works of scholarship, legal works, legal tomes, especially things like that. So uh, by the end of the 18th century, the libraries were routinely just throwing away things, or they weren't, getting them, they weren't asking for them at all. Um, and, uh, and the other thing that publishers would do, the booksellers would do, is if they issued a multi-volume work, and this applies particularly to legal works, you know, law reports and things like this, they would register one volume of them and give the one volume to the library. That then forces the library to buy all of the other volumes. This is a time when libraries have no acquisition budgets at all. So it's a bit of a mystery where they got the money to actually buy these things. Um, so at the end of the 18th century, it, this, this became a kind of scandal when lawyers, in particular at Cambridge University, realized that they didn't have access to the law reports that they needed to actually do their law work. So they, they decided they were going to mount a campaign to actually make the promise of that copyright statute real and have the library collect everything that was published in London. Um, so they started doing this right at the end of the 18th century, and it generated a huge public debate about the nature of publishing, what copyright was, what authorial rights should be. Um, because the, um, the, uh, the, the publishers decided that this claim to be, cl to be collecting everything would be, as they put it, fatal to literary property. If literary property existed, if copyright existed, then essentially seizing books was a violation of it. And they accused the, the libraries of wanting to create universal libraries on the basis of universal piracy. There's a further reason why the publishers felt themselves obliged or able to protest against this and why their campaign went so far as it did. Uh, and it has to do with the very nature of creativity, the nature of what it is to write, to think, to make new knowledge. Um, it, was, it became a romantic conviction, as Wordsworth put it, that works of genius create their own audience. That means that works of genius, when they originally appear, don't have an audience, so they don't sell. Now, this is a kind of self-serving argument on Wordsworth's part, because Wordsworth's poetry didn't sell. 
Um, but he, he comforted himself by saying that, that you know, it would sell. People would realize it's transcendent genius over, over generations. And that was one reason why Wordsworth thought that copyright should be perpetual. You know, true genius will only get its reward if copyright is very long term because genius takes a long time to, to be recognized. Um, so real knowledge or real art is not going to be the kind of thing that's produced by steam presses in, in massive quantities and is protected by the copyright system. It's going to exist as it were under the radar of that system. It's going to be produced in small print runs, typically 50 to 100. Now, so small that you could basically do it in a scriptorium if you wanted. Um, and it was going to be expensive, produced for very select audiences, and those audiences were often going to have access to the, to the libraries and the universities. So if the universities are collecting 10 or 11 copies, that's 10 or 11 out of 50, not 10 or 11 out of 3,000 or 30,000. So it's a big tax. Moreover, it's a worse tax than that because the very readers who might otherwise buy one are now going to get them from the libraries because they're, they're the scholars. So in other words, collecting everything is going to militate against genius. Um, and this gets to, and, and, and the publishers were able to recruit, recruit to their side a whole kind of army of poets, scientists, historians, antiquarians, um, medics, medics, zoologists, uh, William Lawrence, for example, a great surgeon at the time, arguing exactly this, that this bid to create universal libraries was going to kill creativity, kill, kill knowledge. Um, and this has to do also with an argument about the very nature of the times, that this is the moment when political economy of the, the dismal science version, right, Malthus, Ricardo, you know, laissez-faire, all that kind of thing, um, is being set up as the new queen of the sciences and is, and is being portrayed as, as the structuring force for, mod for modernity itself. And a copyright publishing industry is represented as the extension of that into the realm of the mind. So for these, these romantics, the idea is that copyright publishing is, is a kind of soulless, uh, dismal science of, of, of the mind, if you will. Um, so what the Universal Library will collect is precisely not genius, but this thing that is going to be the disastrous character of modern society from then on. It's the, the, the leveling down, the mere repeaters, as they say. Um, so this practice of universal collection militates against creativity and, uh, and for mediocrity. Um, so this is about the prevailing culture of print itself and about culture itself and how culture impinges on knowledge. Knowledge in the making and knowledge in the reading as well as just knowledge as fixed texts, as it were. Um, they thought that if this were actually carried through, then a universal library in practice would become disastrous, not least because they imagine what happens to, say, say supposing you're a student, and they particularly have in mind a law student as it happens, so going into one of these libraries and seeing universality of knowledge put in front of you. You know, imagine the Borghese Library, which goes on forever. Um, what's the effect that that has on you? And in classic 19th century form, the effect that, that they hold it to have on you is demoralization. Um, so, so actually what the word that they use is demoralization, but also depression. So you go in there and you become convinced that whatever you may do, you can never actually contribute something individual and worthwhile to an, to an infinite <laughs> collection. So the effect of collecting things indefinitely is to suppress at a deep psychological level what might then be worthwhile in a future generation. Um, so, so these libraries overgorged with frivolous books would stop seriousness from happening. So they, in the end, they say that it might be useful to have one repository of everything collected. They accept that kind of enlightenment principle, but it shouldn't be public. It should be held under lock and key in the British Museum, rather like the collect, whatever it's called, the, the, the closed <coughs> collection that notoriously is full of lascivious and bawdy books. Um, so this became quite a big alliance between the sciences, poetry, literature, history, um, and, and the commercial world of the publishers who object to it because it's, it's a tax on them. Um, it had one, though, particular vehicle, which was antiquarianism. Antiquarians, we tend to think, is really boring. You know, we think antiquarianism is incredibly dry. But in the early 19th century, it wasn't. It was, it was the vehicle for all kinds of arguments, from like, Burkean Tories to, to Godwinian radicals, <coughs> who wanted to see the foundations of Englishness, as it were, in these, these very particular records of the past that were dug up through church you know, stone rubbings, brass rubbings, things like that. And there was a literary antiquarianism that was devoted to collecting old works of literature and reprinting them in very small editions. Um, one of the champions of this was a man called Samuel Edgerton Bridges, uh, who was an MP and actually became the figurehead of this campaign. 
And the argument here is that antiquarianism, what it is to be English, is going to be destroyed because it produces these small print run things, which are precisely what the, the, the tax of universal deposit is going to, to stop happening. Um, so Bridges ran this campaign, um, and he came within one vote of actually passing a law that would have abolished the existing Copyright Act in Parliament. Um, it took it out of him. Um, in the end, before the, the final vote could be taken, the Prince Regent dissolved Parliament and Bridges was sent into exile as a, as a debtor. And in fact, this, if this is the image before the campaign, this is what he looked like after the campaign, <laughs> which is about as stark an image as before and after as you'll ever get. Um, but, uh, but so, so um, when he left Parliament, the campaign kind of collapsed at a public level, at least for that generation. And it collapsed at the point where the libraries looked like the winners um, because they were now able to go on doing their collecting. But this is where the, the kind of knock-on implication comes. In 1813, 1814, at the time when it looked like Bridges and the publishers might win, and that the copyright might actually be overthrown for this reason, the libraries and the publishers proposed to each other a compromise. And the compromise was this. The publishers would accept a universal deposit, and the libraries liked that. But in return, they wanted a doubling of the term of protection of copyright. It had been 14 years, another 14 if it reverted to the author, and it had stood at that since 1710. Now, 100 years later, the proposal is made that it should be doubled to 28 years. That law was passed just before Bridges left Parliament. And by a one-word amendment that was put in at the last moment, we don't know why, it was extended to reprints. So not just new works, but reprints of old works. So suddenly, you have a breach of principle. Copyright is still a term-limited thing, but it's no longer a short term. And the principle has been breached that, that you're not going to change the term. So, so it's, it's been decided that maybe you can make it longer. In the 1820s, Noah Webster, who was the architect of American copyright law, came to the UK and toured around and heard about this process and decided what a great idea it would be to introduce it into the United States as well. So he came back, campaigned for a mirror version of this law in the United States, and in the early 1830s it was passed as, as the first revision to American copyright law, again doubling the term. That set in train a trend that has continued ever since, of increasing the term of copyright. Um, and applying it to things like reprints, um, something that was incredibly controversial right at the beginning. Uh, and we know what the outcome of that is. The outcome is that it creates an entire class of books called, in our day, orphan works. Um, and the outcome of an entire class of books called orphan works is an intractable problem of copyright if you want to include those orphan works in our version of universality, which is digital networks and scanning. So the, the sense, and, and this, is, this is what became for Judge Chin, the breaking point for the, the revised settlement is orphan works. So Judge Chin says at the end, having turned it all back, maybe it would work if instead of having an opt-in, sorry, instead of having an opt-out uh, agreement, we had an opt-in one for orphan works. So orphan works is actually the, the, the key thing. That whole problem exists as a residue of a previous debate about universality, authorship, and knowledge back in the early uh, 19th century. Um, and that problem of old knowledge, of course, it ends up being as, as important to us now as it was then. Uh, one of the differences, though, is that in, in 1810 or so, at an age when economics wasn't yet the all-pervading authority that it now is, the scope of the question was seen to be deeper, and it was seen to be about the kind of society that economics was creating. Um, and I think this is, there is a sense in which history can tell us things by, if you go back, you see, as it were, um, the deep nature of, of, of issues that, uh, that, are, that are still current now in a way that we can't see now because we're too close to them. And that's one way in which I think that may be true. Um, so we could ask today, how will readers make new knowledge out of the undifferentiated reservoir of digitized me mediocrity that they get with things like Google? Uh, will they even want to make new knowledge out of it? And what long-term trends might we unintentionally spark in our bids to pacify warring factions? And these are the kinds of questions that I think history encourages us to ask. Now, I don't think we can ask those questions. We can answer those questions now. Sorry, I, don't, I certainly can't answer them. Um, but a focus on uses, which is what I've been trying to encourage in part, does allow us to raise and, and, and establish the importance of a related question. Um, because this, this suggests an approach, albeit a rather speculative one, to the problem of the future of the book itself. 
Perhaps an answer to, to that question, the future of the book, is to be sought not in the architecture of the codex, let alone things like look and feel, which people sometimes rather emotively talk about, um, nor even in the anxieties about you know, orphan works and things like that and monopoly that swirl around Google, but instead in the peculiar pairing of object and practice, the dyad formed by the conjunction of, of reading with books that the romantics were concerned about. Uh, with universal libraries in the early 19th century. Because that, that pairing, of course, always takes place in some setting, in some physical environment, even if the networks exist and are spreading text kind of limitlessly. And the importance of that diet was stressed in a, in a great work that appeared in English just as this debate over universal libraries in the late 18th and early 19th century was gearing up. Namely, of course, Immanuel Kant's What is Enlightenment, one of the kind of classic texts for, for modernity, if you like. Now, Kant had a, a, a famous paradoxical assertion that a private place of reading and writing were essential for the authority of the public realm. His idea is that if you, if, you, if you want to have a public realm that has epistemic authority, the only way you get that is by having people doing their reading and writing for the public in private. Otherwise, they are, as it were, representatives of interest to some extent when they act in, in, in open in the, in the public. Um, and it's one's duty as a member of the public to feed back into, into the, the, the overall realm from these private spaces. And that, that work initiated a long tradition of arguments along similar lines. It was actually one of the first works of Kant to be translated into English, in, if I remember right, 1798. But for that tradition, in order for public reason to persist, participants need to be able to retreat into a private space. And in, the, in, in terms of our universality, that means to disconnect. Because one of the one of the central elements of, of Google's universal library is that you are being tracked when you do things. That's what it's for to some extent for Google. And this is the, as I said, I'd come back to this issue that for Judge Chim was not an issue. It seems to me for it is, that it is. Um, so this possibility of disconnecting is lost when an important purpose, and perhaps according to that Google engineer, the important purpose of the universal library is precisely to subordinate reading to non-display uses. That is, if the purpose of mass digitization is to convert not only works, but work, viewings, re uses, readings, into data, which can then be merged and sorted and combined and analyzed and mined and, and, give, and have consequences of one kind or another. To paraphrase that en engineer, what AIs will read is not just books, but us. Um, and the process is not necessarily sinister. On the contrary, it's actually useful, of course, um, and it's very convenient. Overall, it's you know, quite arguably a very good thing. And there's, there are reasons why Google is able to do it, and there are reasons why Judge Chin doesn't think it's an issue. But a certain caution is in order, I think. Um, for example, in the first six months of 2010, Google received 4,000 requests from the US government uh, for data on users, quote unquote, and another 1,300 from the UK government and more from other governments around the world. And in typical Google fashion, there you can get a Google map that actually shows you where these requests have come from. It doesn't say any more than that, but, but it tells you roughly numbers. And many of these requests are said to relate to criminal cases, but that's as much as we know. It's hard, though, not to imagine the practice expanding once the information is available. In the UK, to cite what I suspect may be a relevant comparison, raw data on phone tap authorizations have been made public since the first term of the Blair administration in 1997. And it turns out that that practice is now very widespread indeed. In just the one year of 2008, for example, various state agencies going down to things like local school boards, um, local authorities, I'm not sure about school boards, uh, made more than 500,000 requests for phone surveillance. That's in one year. What that means is that uh, the population of Britain is about 60 million, so you can do the math. Your chances of being surveyed overall are yeah, roughly one in 100 um, per year. So what happens when claims of security or morality tempt, their authority, tempt the authorities, or maybe worse, their subcontractors? Because those, you know, the, the um, Kellogg, Brown and Root, for example. Um, what happens when their subcontractors ask for or even subpoena data about reading. Data that a universal library devoted to this practice and this purpose must, by definition, necessarily have. Now, those data can be and are anonymized, but it's not clear how they're anonymized, and it's not clear how rigorous and robust the systems are. Chin, Chin didn't ask. He just uh, put forward this, this confident assertion that it will be possible to, to 
create systems that will robustly anonymize the data and therefore obviate this concern. But if one's convinced, at least at some level, of the Kantian argument that public authority resides, on, resides partly or depends on the ability to be private in one's reading, one can ask legitimately, whatever the anonymization technique, where does the authority of public reason abide given the form of universal library that we will now have? Does it even exist at all anymore? And I'll leave you with that question. <laughs> Yeah, sure, in principle. I mean, firstly, I mean, it's, it's a very distant thought experiment. I mean, the, the thought that people would do that. I, you know, but I think that, um, you know, I mean, there is always a problem of monopoly pricing. I'm not, I, I, I would tend to side myself with, um, ironically, actually, some of the, the more uh, neoclassical economists on this and say that it's less of a problem than people have tended to think. Um, because for one thing, monopolies can be regulated. It becomes a matter of public politics, if you were. It becomes a problem of, of uh, in this country, Congress actually regulating the industry in the way that things like the power industry is regulated. Um, the, this may be a relic of living in, in the UK, where although it's before really my time, there was for a long time, um, ma a major medium was monopolized, which was radio. It was, you know, radio was a monopoly of the BBC for, for at least in legal terms, for a long time. Practically, it never was, but in legal terms, it was. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, even if that very unlikely thought experiment were, were to become something like reality, my sense of, of um, the way that Google works is that they would see it as in their interest to, to not go that small but expensive route, but to go the big but relatively cheap route. Now, relatively cheap may still be more expensive than you would want to pay, but it's not going to be like uh, the 18th century London publishing industry, which was, which was small, kept its ranks narrow, charged high prices for small impressions. You know, I don't think it's going to be like that. But I think, that, I think the basic thought experiment, is, it, I've got to say, is, is so unrealistic that you know, I don't think it would work. Sorry, I'm not sure if you know. Yeah, but like, th that's a very interesting point. But the, the, uh, there's, a, there's a culture or an, an ethos of the library profession in the United States that has developed such that the, the data on that are destroyed. So yes, they can, but the, the, in fact, those data are not retained. I mean, unless, the, I'm not sure what happens in, in Ohio, but, but, um, but no, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a I mean, the, this, what, what, you, what, that, what that actually gets to is an interesting question of whether there is a, an important consequence for something like ethos in public institutions versus private institutions, monopolistic or not. Um, so uh, the library community, the librarians, would say that there is, and that the collection of these data, which I, I think are actually destroyed for, for ethical reasons, um, is kind of less to be worried about because then it's subject to a public service ethos. So it becomes a question of, of that, rather deep issue of something like, um, I'm not sure what you call it, political philosophy or something. Um, but, uh, but I mean, yes, you're right. You, you, in principle, it's, it's done. But I believe, that, I believe that they're destroyed for these reasons. I don't know, do you know different? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, I, yeah, I, uh, I guess it's a content question. Um, and it goes back to what you were saying about the romantic presumption that books from a centralized metropolitan publishing industry uh, contributed 
to the notion of what would constitute universality. So those were the things that were collected. Um, at the same time, there's a kind of rapid growth in, in provincial presses throughout the 18th and 19th century, um, and other things besides books are being produced. Um, so that notion of universality is a rather limited one. And I'm wondering if there is a some kind of correlation currently with the Google case. Um, what, I mean, this universal, I mean, it seems to be it's dominated by books for one. Uh, I've not done an exhaustive search by any means, but I'm wondering if you know of uh, sort of that aspect of a sort of content collection, because I do think that is important too, um, sure. and how those decisions are, are, are made um, continue to constitute what would be a, a sort of limited universality. That's not yeah, no, I think that, that's absolutely right. Um, and it is very limited in that way. Um, the, you know, there's an, there's an interesting thing that could be said almost, this is rather a highfalutin way of putting it, but about uh, media revolutions in general, which is that, um, and Peter Salabras at, at Penn has been making this point, that um, whenever you have something like the introduction of steam printing or printing itself in the 15th century or now the digital world, that, that itself may not be revolutionary, but what it often does is it creates a revolution in the older medium. So whatever happened in the 15th and 16th century, he would say, there was certainly a writing revolution then, because suddenly people are writing much more, if only to fill in the forms and so on that the printers have. And that's true with steam printing in the, in the early 19th century. So steam printing comes along, and there's a, there's a great centralization. You know, these are heavily capitalized operations, relatively few of them, and they churn out huge numbers of copies. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of funneling effect in that way. But in, in the same generation, up through about 1850 or so, uh, there's also a huge proliferation of hand presses, as you say, very provincial, all the way across the country, often dealing with um, lower class communities, relatively locally, but circulating knowledge with a tremendous frenzy, if you like, uh, so, and sometimes quite advanced levels. So you, there's, a, there's a great work by Adrian, Adrian Desmond called The Politics of Evolution that tracks these things dealing with biological doctrines through this period. Um, and, and they're not just imitative, they're, they're originative too. And you're right, the Universal Library of, of this period was not gonna collect most of that stuff because it didn't really appear in the, the big metropolitan scene at all. Um, it, was, it was here one day, gone the next. Um, and so the Universal Library, such as it came into existence, was not only going to be a kind of monument to the new political economic copyright mind, but it was also going to be a severe misrepresentation of what actuality was out there. And you could argue something like that about the Google project. I don't think Google is meant to be a kind of one-to-one -one mirroring of the world. But, um, but you could argue something like, if the aspiration is going to be to create some, some kind of universality, which matters for, for the search engine aspect of it, then um, missing all of the things that Google misses, which are being produced now by print, right? because there's a similar kind of revolution going on in the printing world, um, is going to end up being more and more consequential. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things about the Bob Danton Public Digital Library scheme, which you, I guess people will know about, this is a, a bid to produce a kind of public counterpart to the Google project, is that as it's gone on, my understanding is that it's developed an ambition to try to, to extend into those kinds of realms and not make that mistake. Um, now, I'm not sure whether that's a good idea because it, I think it runs the risk of creating something that is so big and so kind of ramified. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean that could be. Huge. That that seems like it. You could you run the risk of creating something that's in vision so huge that you end up doing nothing, right? Um, but but yes, I think it's a real thing. It's, it's in principle a big problem. The, 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 I mean, going back a while, maybe, well, Jefferson is, 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 tends to be the person that one quotes on this, so hundreds of years. There have been essentially two models of how you try to preserve knowledge, um, not just knowledge, but stuff. Um, one of which is that you, you uh, as it were, lock it up. 
in, safe, in, in repositories. And the other is the opposite, that you make so many copies of it that you couldn't possibly destroy all of them. And this is Jefferson's idea, that, that, that the great thing about printing is not preservation of individual copies, it's that it makes 10,000 of them. And that makes it impossible to destroy all 10,000 because you distribute them around the world. Um, the, the, there is a sense in which if you think of a Google or any universal library as being a repository model, it runs that risk that, that you could destroy it. Now, the way that the, the Google project tries to get around that is by having several uh, places in which it's stored. So it's not just Google. There's a thing called Hearty Trust as well, which will have a kind of mirror side of it. And there, that, I think, if I remember right, do you remember the details of this? Something like Google has two versions of it and Hearty has two. I, I forget how many exactly there are. But the, the idea is a, as a kind of um, a dispersal of the repositories. So, the, so try to get at least some degree of redundancy of that kind. Um, but you're right. Even, I mean, supposing you, you make, um, supposing it's four, four copies of the whole thing, uh, that's still only four, and that's not 10,000. Now, the, the thing about this is, which I think makes it different, is that the, the Universal Library is itself um, a kind of organizational bringing together of things that already exist in tens of, tens of thousands of copies. So it's not like the Library of Alexandria, say, where if you destroy it, you know, you're, you're getting at the core. There isn't really a core anymore. Um, so, so I think that the, the status of the, of the repository has changed. Mark? Uh, yes, I have, uh, uh, I have a question about, um, you know, uh, your reference to the romantic uh, idea that you'd be depressed by seeing two books all at once. Uh, and I wonder if you just wrote that. Uh, I found that striking, and, and I wondered if, if that kind of concern might be a legitimate one for, uh, uh, for, for something like the, the Google project. And, and I think also Kant here uh, asking, so the problem that you're raising uh, that, that a Kantian perspective would, would, would have would be uh, the absence of privacy. Uh, but I'm also wondering about, about questions about the kind or the quality of attention uh, that, that uh, uh, the difference, in other words, of the kind of attention that one uh, might have in front of a computer screen where one instantly has access to every other book on the topic versus the kind of attention uh, that one would have either on a, a reader that was disconnected or, or, or a book, and whether we should be concerned about that difference in attention, or whether you feel that that's something that we can't possibly control. So I'm going to ask, ask about that. No, I think that that's, a, in some ways, that's, that's going to be a key question for the next generation, you know, um, attention. Um, it's one of those things, I mean, just to bracket this for a minute, it's one of those questions that does tend to come up, though, um, every generation. Like I can remember when I was a child, my parents and all kinds of parents were concerned that television was doing this to us, um, because now you can now you have three channels. You know, <laughs> uh, you know uh, this is in Britain. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, you know, so what's gonna, this is going to be the end of civilization, um, and it was, but the. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but then, you know, nonetheless, it, it it is it is a real issue, I think. Um, not so much because it's a kind of once and for all step change issue now, but it's something that, that a, a responsible culture has to continuously monitor and adapt to. And I think that um, where, this, where the, the, the rubber hits the road with this is actually education systems. Um, this is not a matter of technology. We, we can't, we're not going to deal with this by getting some kind of technological fix. What we need to do is to train people to be, as it were, critically engaged um, always working uh, monitors of what's going on. You can flick through things very quickly. The, the zap, zap, zap thing you can do. If you've got, well, you can do it anyway, but, but you can do it, as, as it, as it, to my eyes, responsibly. If you, you have kind of trained into you critical techniques that kick in very fast. Um, and uh, that includes, for example, an understanding that what appears on the screen is not actuality. Uh, what appears on the screen is heavily mediated by algorithms, codes, aesthetic designs, and so forth. And one needs to, to imbue in our generation, our future generations, the ability to read for those very fast, autom almost automatically. In the way that in the past, you know, people have been trained to read for, you know, narrative or, or argument or something like that. It's, it's you know, the latest version of that kind of thing. Um, I think that this is, this is a matter for innovative design in schooling going right back to elementary school. Um, 
And it's uh, yeah, the way that I, sorry, this is very, again, a high pollution way. The way that I tend to think about this is that it's Miltonic. You know, if you think of Areopagitica, the great Milton tract against censorship in the 17th century, um, it is against censorship, but half of it is actually about the responsibilities of reading in a, in a city like London. And he has a marvelous passage about how in revolutionary 1640s London, um, people are sitting up in their garrets, burning the midnight oil, reading tracts, and as he puts it, yielding to the force of reason and convincement. Um, and he, he has this, it's a, it's a fantastic image of, of Republican virtue through, through reading communities. Um, but for Milton, reading had to be, in some sense, work, even when it's enjoyable and even when you lose yourself in it. And I think that the, the task for um, educationalists is to uh, you know, re-imbue some sensibility like that for the digital age. That, that, sorry, that, that sounds hopelessly Puritan. Um, you know, but it's a utopian dystopia, is it? <laughs> No, it is. And these are very two. Yeah. I, I wanted to just add, yeah. add, like replace them too. I mean, this notion you mentioned that Google will not have the problem that, that Jefferson mentioned because there are going to be 10,000 books, but they are being destroyed already. Yeah, they are. They're, that's true. Okay, so and, how and you say we only need two yeah. copies for the whole system of each book, all the other ones can go away because yeah. we don't have any money. So there is that happening already. No, that, that's absolutely right. Every, all, every, every phase of this kind of sequence of universalities, if you will, has had not only collection and preservation, but, des but destruction as well. Um, and that's most clear with microfilm you know, in the modern era, when there's a notorious case of Nicholson Baker and the, the sure. newsprint, right? And he was right. You know, whatever the morality you think of it, he was right. Massive amounts of newsprint were destroyed on the premise that microfilm was going to be good enough. And the fact is that it's not good enough because the quality of it is bad. And it doesn't have the, you can't, you can't do the kind of history of the book stuff. If you don't have access to the actual stuff, the actual material things, um, that's that. I was trying to get get at that in part in the early stuff about Syracuse and moving things off site. No, it's absolutely the case that um, that destruction and and preservation are interdependent in this and always have been. Um, and I think it, it may be that. Uh, I hesitate to say that it's, that it's necessarily the case because I'm, I'm not a philosopher and I, I, I'm not good at kind of discerning necessity. But I think that one should pause before being too, uh, too much, before, before indulging too much kind of lamentations and gnashing of teeth about the mere fact of destruction itself. Um, because uh, destruction to some extent is always happening. I think there's destruction and destruction. Um, and if you have, for example, mass production of books, I don't think you need to keep every single one. I'm not a fetishist about books to that extent. And I think that there's, there is a kind of a cultural cost-benefit analysis to be done, not, not, a, not an economic one. I'm against this business of only buying two books for the whole of the University of California system, for example, which they do now. They, they, you know, as you say, they have buses that, that take the vans, up, vans that take books up and down the West Coast. I'm really against that. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I, I'm a bit leery of arguments which would be absolutist about this. Um, you know, uh, there's a book written by, I think, the head of the Venezuelan library system, uh, on the history of the destruction of books. I don't know whether you've seen this. It's a small paperback. And it's actually, it's a weirdly heartening book to me in a certain way because it charts, you know, enormous numbers of books and whole libraries that have been destroyed over the thousands of years. And you do in the end, and it's, and it's just one after the other, you know. So, uh, and yet there is a sense in which you emerge at the far end of the book and you think, well, you know, we're still here. Um, 
comparison that you're drawing between this romantic experience is precisely that there, there was struggle over the, the extension of the principles of political economy as, uh, as being hyper-dominant. And the difference now is that they have been so naturalized that we don't notice them. Yeah. And that to argue against the principles of political economy in favor of the book uh, is to marginalize oneself by essentially defying nature. Uh, uh, in, the, in the more liminal moment where the triumph of political economy as an ideology was not as pronounced as it is in the 21st century, the terms of the discussion, the Kantian debate, if you will, uh, uh, in the public sphere were entirely different. And this is what gives me a more pessimistic view of the current moment than of the previous view. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I think that's absolutely right. You know, we've internalized these these kinds of terms so much that to to try to speak a different language, as it were, is almost to make yourself look mad. Uh, you know, what is dismissed as mad yes. and what I um, to Yeah, and I th but I think it's worth, I mean, let me put it this way. I think, I think that the way to make um, arguments against things like only buying one copy for the whole of the West Coast is, is, I think, to argue and to draw on statistics, which I think can be drawn to show this, that what changes when you do that is not just the speed of knowledge production, but the quality. Um, so if, if you have to draw up every book, you know, if you live in Berkeley and you have to draw up every book from San Diego, it's not just that you have to wait two days for them. It's that thinking is actually crippled by that. Yes. Um, and um, I mean, I... I but that can't be quantified in terms of political economy. It, you can actually go some way towards that. And what I, I, I draw your attention to is a couple of things. But I, sorry, I hesitate, I hesitate to kind of invoke my own institution, but it is, the sense, it is the case, in fact, that the University of Chicago has actually bucked the trend on this. Um, so I think alone among all elite institutions in the US, we now, we're just building this huge $60 million library. It's gonna open in a week or two. Um, and we will be the only place that has everything on site still. We have no off-site storage. Um, and this is because of research that was done, uh, particularly by the sociology department, into what it actually did to research knowledge making to shift things off site. Who were the users who were actually drawing books off the shelves? Um, you know, what does it actually do? What is it we want to get in the end out of this? Uh, and they did this and they submitted reports, which I believe are available online. If you search through the website, you'll find them, which had a big enough effect that the administration actually put money into this, which I was amazed, I, you know, I thought this was absolutely kind of extraordinary. That, the, that an administration in a major university today would actually throw money into this and not just put the books off in Gary. And they didn't, they actually put it all on site. So that's one thing. The other thing I'd point to is um, research that's been done on the quality of scientific uh, referencing in, in research papers in, in especially um, the biological sciences. Uh, but it's actually extensive, it's now been done across the sciences more broadly than that by a colleague of mine in sociology called James Evans. And again, some of this is available online. It was published in Science and various other places in the last few years, which is very counterintuitive because what it shows is that as the sciences have gone to completely online delivery, as you say, no, no print journals, just online stuff, the range of reference and the depth of reference in papers has reduced markedly. Um, and the, the epistemic counterpart of that is that we're arriving at consensus much faster without exploring alternatives. Um, so that's, a, that's, an, that's, a, that's something that, that gets to um, the very essence of what it is that universities are supposed to exist for. You know, and I think that um, you can argue that, at a, and the point about that is that it gets beyond the kinds of things that are always put forward as arguments for preserving on-site stuff, which are things like browsability, you know, looking down shelves, humanistic things. Um, that, that kind of argument never washes with administrators. But this one may do, because it's actually demonstrable in terms of databases of millions you can show it quantitatively, um, and it is epistemically potentially huge. I want to raise a question in the biological sciences. I, I had the impression that the reason for not looking back as far has nothing to do with how the data is obtained, <coughs> but for the publishing parish attitude, that if you look far back, 
to often find what working on has already been done. I can tell you the first mistake I'll read our review about something that I published, and I'm not referenced, and it's brought up as brand new, and something that was published by me 20 years ago. Done. So is that the, is it because of how the data is obtained, or is it because of the attitude of the, the community toward the publish or perish? Um, it's certainly, I mean, I wish James were here, he could speak to this directly from his, his work, so I, I'm not sure of what the answer is, but my sense is that it's probably going to be both. You know, it, it usually is with these things. It's not, they're not usually reducible to some technological change. Um, but on the other hand, my sense is that um, this is something that you can track back over the years as more and more journals have, have become online and have been integrated into the various search engine pattern recognition things and stuff like that. And you can track how it changes over time. And it, it I believe, follows the trajectory of this increasing scope of the journal systems online. So um, unless, as it were, the institutional pressures not to see pre previous work have also changed in that way, it looks like the more important thing is actually the massive digitization of the journals. But, I, but you know, as I say, I will defer to my absent colleague who's actually done the work. Uh, but it's fascinating stuff because it's so counterintuitive. You know, it's, it's not what is supposed to happen. Um. Oh, well, no. Everybody <laughs> wants to talk to you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the competition. Google is not the only one doing this. There's Project Gutenberg, and there's an uh, internet archive, and then there's ones that are doing it for pay. And I wonder how this plays into your yeah, those uh, those do exist and they have existed, and they're, but they're much much smaller, of yeah. course, than Google. Go but than but Google. In some um, <laughs> yeah, no, they they use for the Internet Archive especially is something that that um, you know is, has that status. I think um, this is and, and I don't know what really I don't have a line on this. I mean, I, it's it's often said that their existence is kind of imperiled by Google because they'll just be kind of swamped, as it were, by, by the Google project. But I don't think that's really true, because I think that they, those kinds of projects may go some way to meeting the need that you pointed out of covering the stuff that Google is not going to cover, you know, the counterpart to ephemera or provincial stuff and stuff like that. Um, I think the issue may go down in the end to not, as it were, being smaller than Google, but being bigger than Google. You know, what is it that one's going to have access to that's going to cover both the Google world and the proliferating world of these other projects, such that if you want to see patterns, you can see them in a way that supervenes these, um, these corporate distinctions. And as far as I know, maybe in, di in, in individual disciplines, people are doing these kinds of uh, initiatives. But as far as I know, there's nothing yet which has that kind of all-embracing ambition. Uh, perhaps the next generation of Universal Library will be like that. talked about the uh, vacuousness of the argument that distribution of knowledge to the developing world was really beyond tertiary. Um, and that because most research still occurs in the developed world, obviously most useful electronic information is going to be in the developed world. But it doesn't really address the use of this technology and the distribution of information that is otherwise So uh, mm. while it, I have no doubt that the statistics would verify that this, that's where most information is currently being used, would you allow for the fact that over time the developed world, the developing world will benefit from it? I think it probably will. You know, my, my sense of it is is that that's that's the trajectory. Um, it's a long, long way away from happening right now, and it's dependent on things that um, are not usually thought of in the same context, or in, in the same light. So, you know, the establishment of, of rather 
baseline telecommunication networks, for example. Um, so physical infrastructure, it depends on that, or wireless networks of particular um, robustness and speed. And those things are, are so sorely lacking in much of the, the real developing world that you know, it's a long way off. Uh, and and the, the, um, the kind of idealism of open access, especially in the sciences, which has always made reference to, to the ability to reach these, these uh, disadvantaged communities, um, is kind of way generations ahead of what the actuality is. If you, uh, you know, there, again, there's been social scientific researchers who have done the mapping and have seen the density, as it were, of reference to open access science journals. And it's, it's virtually zero, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's all, it's actually interesting, my, my understanding is that it's actually, it's not so much um, the US, because most of the people who are interested in this in the US work in universities. And so they are not, they're not the target community either. It's actually kind of middle ranking places, Slovenia, say. Um, so it's not the really poor parts of the world and it's not the really rich parts of the world that are benefiting the most. Now that's not to say that it shouldn't be done. You know, I'm all in favor of it. I think access is great. Um, it's just to say that, that if, what, if one's interest is in, as it were, tracking and understanding what's actually happening rather than planning for, in a kind of futuristic way for, for what's going to go on in the distant future, then this is the kind of thing one needs to, to know. You know, um, the planning for the future thing, the, visual, the, the vision thing, as they say, uh, you know, that's the realm of MIT Media Lab and that kind of thing, these boosters. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's all fine. It's just that I think, I think that there can, there's too easy a confusion that's made between the idealistic uh, projection of what might happen and what's actually happening. Um, and there are too many, and just in general, in the history of technology and social history, um, there have been too many times when what seem to be evident trajectories have been interrupted or d disrupted or sent in different directions throughout human history for us to say that there is an inevitability about, say, in 20 years' time, everywhere in sub-Saharan Africa being where France is now. You know, I think that that's, that's a big gamble in that. Adrian, thanks very much. Um,